We're here. Octavia tried to tell us. Number Numbers. 16. 16, Jinx. <laughs> I can't believe we're at number 16 already. I can't believe we're still doing these. I'm excited that we are. And you know, yeah. when we began, we said, uh, I mean, it felt very critical and time compressed and we were thinking about the pandemic and then we're thinking about politics and thinking about how the pandemic was not ending in a couple months <laughs> like we all thought it was. And we said, well, we're going to keep doing these as long as we're growing from them, as long as we're learning, as long as we're having a good time. And there are so many aspects of the pandemic that have lingered. First of all, a lot of people haven't been able to get vaccinations for whatever reason. They're too young. They're immunocompromised. They have conditions that prevent them from being vaccinated. So there's sort of this weird double space where some people are still living in pandemic fear <laughs> and the rest of us, you know, in some ways are moving on, but in varying degrees. I've been to a couple movies. I'm going to do my first flight next week. Will I be just flying willy nilly like I used to? Heck no. This is to see my dad. I haven't seen my dad in so long and that's a special trip. I have no intention of uh, starting regular flights. I have no intention of being out more than necessary. You know, we're still kind of in a, in a tenuous space where things could go a lot of different ways. And out of also respect for our neighbors, uh, you know, we can't pretend it's over when it's not really, really over. And I feel like it's changed us, right? It's, there's no back to normal. It's, you know, on to whatever is next. You know, we are not the same. Uh, our institutions, our systems, the way we do business, nothing is the same in the U.S. and most certainly isn't. You know, in so many other parts of the world, you don't have the same kind of access to even the vaccines that we do right. um, in the U.S. And so it's, and it's still not a cure, right? I mean, it's still, no, no um, there is not. It's still not a cure, right? So there's still so many things that uh, are going to be so different. And this has really been a way, I think, bias way, right? To help us think about how do we survive? How do we thrive? How do we create? How do we stave off isolation? Um, how do we do community in the midst of all of this? Yes. And we have an amazing uh, guest joining us today to talk about all kinds of aspects of creativity, pandemic, technology, science and math, computers, the relationship between all these things with the arts. So we'll, we'll get started with uh, our, our special guest, Dr. Natrice Gaskins. So as we normally do, we'll do some more introductions so you know who all is here and we'll have our conversation and we will take questions and answers and please put some things in the chat. We uh, I think we have some from ahead of time, other we'll just work with the chat, and we will um, bring some of those to our guests as well. If you're talking about us on Twitter, please do use the hashtag Octavia Tried. We've been able to build up quite some depth with that hashtag over the past year. <laughs> uh, so people do watch it and pay attention to it, and it helps people learn about this uh, series. Yeah, and you get to have like a parallel conversation. It's like your second chat. And it's not a Reeve loves herself a chat. I do. I don't often get to sneak out to Twitter. It, it's a little <laughs> bit too much multitasking, even for me, <laughs> in the middle of a webinar. But but sometimes I pull it off. Well, I am happy to introduce uh, my friend and colleague and co-host, Tanana Reeve Du, an award-winning author who teaches Black horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA. She's an executive producer on Shudder's groundbreaking documentary, Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror, a leading voice in Black speculative fiction for more than 20 years. Dew has won an American Book Award, an NAACP Image Award, and a British Fantasy Award. And her writing has been included in Best of the Year anthologies. Her books include Ghost Summer, Stories, My Soul to Keep, and The Good House. She and her late mother, civil rights activist Patricia Stevens Dew, co-authored Freedom in the Family, a mother-daughter memoir of the fight for civil rights. She is married to author Stephen Barnes, with whom she collaborates on screenplays. They live with their son, Jason, and two cats. 
The Reverend Dr. Monica A. Coleman is Professor of Africana Studies at the University of Delaware. She's also an ordained elder in the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the Church of My Grandmother, and me, an initiate of traditional Yoruba religion. She works at the intersection of faith, culture, and social justice. She's the author or editor of six books and several articles and book chapters that focus on the role of faith in addressing critical social and philosophical issues. Her book, Making a Way Out of No Way, A Womanist Theology, is required reading at colleges and universities around the country. Her memoir, Bipolar Faith, A Black Woman's Journey with Faith and Depression, received the Silver Illumination Award in 2017. Dr. Coleman speaks widely on religious pluralism, religion and mental health, sexual and domestic violence, and navigating change. She lives in a lively intergenerational household where she has an avid, where she is I was upgrading you to having an, an <laughs> avid vegan cook, <laughs> but where she is an avid vegan cook and cyclist. And I can, I can read uh, our, our guest introduction. I, I've known, uh, I'll call you Natrice. Now y'all have to know she is Dr. Gaskins. Okay. She worked hard for that PhD, but she is Natrice to me. I've known you for some time. She's an African-American digital artist academic, cultural critic, and advocate of STEAM fields. You take STEM and you add the A for the arts and you get STEAM. In her work, she explores, quote, techno vernacular creativity and Afrofuturism. I can't wait to hear about that. Dr. Gaskins teaches, writes fab, fabs, and makes art using algorithms and machine learning. She has taught multimedia, computational media, visual art, and even advanced placement computer science principles with high school students who majored in the arts. She earned a BFA in computer graphics with honors from Pratt Institute in 1992 and an MFA in art and technology from the School of Art uh, from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 1994. She received a doctorate in digital media from Georgia Tech in 2014. Currently, Dr. Gaskins is a resident in the Autodesk Technology Center's Outside Network. She is the assistant director of the Leslie Steam Learning Lab at Leslie University. Her first full-length book, Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation through the MIT Press, will be available in August. Gaskin served as board president of the National Alliance for Media, Arts, and Culture. The Alliance was on the board of the Community Technology Center's network, CTCNet. She is currently on the board of Artisans Asylum. Please join me in welcoming the very talented and just brilliant Dr. Natrice Gaskins. Welcome to Octavia Tried. Welcome. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Well, you know, we always start, well, I don't know, I kind of want to start with your pandemic experience, which is a little bit of a tradition here, uh, even though the pandemic is not over, and I want to make that point, um, there were a lot of periods that were a lot more uncertain and horrifying uh, in this country in particular than the moment where we are now, where, you know, ER nurse after ER nurse is like, oh, I love vaccines because just the numbers of hospitalizations and deaths are dwindling, dwindling. But when it was at its worst and its most uncertain, I'm wondering what the experience was like for you and how did you cope with it? Sure, I'm, I'm a bit of a, I'll say a hermit, but uh, in my, my home is my my spot, so um, I just kind of just became, you know, I just I stay here. I'm not going anywhere. I have to. I work from home, teach from home, do my art stuff from home, and everything else shut down. This has been my place. So everything's been online, and um, lots of other cool stuff has been happening. So including finishing the book during the pandemic. So. So you were able to to make it a very sort of creatively rich period. Um, and in fact, in some ways, it was like, uh, you know, obviously a lot of people were having a harder time. But for a lot of us who are artists and kind of hermit, like especially me having to drive an hour and a half back and forth to UCLA and now I don't have to do that. <laughs> there are advantages that you were able to find in pandemic life, it sounds like. I mean, I had a former student passed away in March of lockdown time, mm. um, he was a Cal Art student and finishing up, he was ready to graduate and he had a two, two year old. Um, and so that hit in March, late March. So 
you know, shut down. It just happened. So that made it real for me. And it also made me even more committed to being a hermit because he's younger, you know, he's beginning his life, you know, as an adult with his family and suddenly he's not. So um, very talented young man who passed away. So that was a, for me, it was like aha moment when I got the text and then I realized that that had happened. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, that's rough, especially when young people pass away. That's, that's Mm -hmm. very, very rough. Well, what, let's talk about Octavia then. I, I've interviewed you before. And, you know, when I was teaching at Spelman College, we were somewhat in each other's orbits. I saw you give a presentation at the Spelman Museum when you were, were more of a baby. Uh, eh, not so much a baby scholar, but you were not, you know, you didn't have your PhD yet. You hadn't been out in the world. But before we talk about all the incredible things you're doing, let's go back to the thing that really all of us are sort of gathering around like a campfire, which is our love for Octavia Butler's work and particularly Parable of the Sower. Um, I know that wasn't the first novel that you came in contact with. So just maybe if you could share a little bit of your journey with Octavia's work and then land on the aspects of Parable of the Sower that you think have been most either prescient or helpful for you. Um, I think the first book I read might have been Kindred um, way back. And so I don't remember. But I think I remember reading Kindred. I feel like I read it really early on. Um, and then, you know, basically started reading, you know, more of her work. Uh, Parable I read, I want to say college uh, that I read. And then I was, you know, really into it at that point. So um, and then, you know, Earthseed really struck me. And so when I got IBM sponsored me to do an art, an Afrofuturist simulation in the virtual 3D space. And so I chose to recreate Earthseed, like a play, like a sort of sand pit playground um, called Earthseed that people could go in in the virtual 3D space um, in 2010. So um, there was a, a kind of Earthseed playground and the reason why I made it a playground is, you know, there were growing things like trees that looked very otherworldly in that space, but it was kind of a place to sort of just, you know, you've seen some stuff now just kind of come here and, and, and create. And so this idea of creation was uh, uh, an inspiration um, that I pulled from the book. I am um, heartsick that I missed that. Playground, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm where? <laughs> Wow, that made me so sad. <laughs> so cool. I mean, it's inspiring. Don't get me wrong, but it's sad that I missed it. Is what I'm saying. So, but that's fantastic because that just illustrates that you've been engaging with Octavia's work in a wider space mm-hmm. for a very long time. You know, 2010 yeah. uh, is quite a ways back, and was really running ahead of, I would say, a lot of what we're seeing as the current renaissance of both Octavia's work, like Parable just got on the bestsellers list for the very first time last year, as well as Afrofuturism in general. So I just, you know, you're really a pioneer. um, And I would imagine an accidental one, as most pioneers are. Do you think of yourself that way? Um, It's interesting because... um, Right now, I'm in a community of folks who are considered to be digital art pioneers, people that I knew about, you know, for years, who I'm suddenly part of projects with. And they're labeling this community. Um, this is through the NFT stuff for eco friendly stuff. Um, but there are names in there that I've known for, for a long time. This is 35 pioneering um, digital artists. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and then I go back and I remember the first time I touched a computer to make art was 1987. So, um, and that was high school. So maybe, because that's kind of the beginning of the computer graphics kind of begins in the late eighties, um, and early nineties. So possibly, um, uh, do I get, did I get a lot of attention? No, um, I haven't really gone in uh, the direction of the arts. Um, I went in for education, but not for as an artist because I didn't really see digital art, the work that I was trying to do and what space would that be in? It, it's not really visual art, it's, it's something else. Hmm. So um, I just kind of did it in the background and uh, kept doing community stuff. But now that's changing, I would say, would you agree? Uh, well, suddenly the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> it was the pandemic as people started to be like, 
okay, so we got to do stuff. We can't be in galleries. We can't be in museums. We can't be um, in buildings. So how about we do stuff online? And so then um, I'm like, oh, well, I've been doing that for years. <laughs> um, so no, no issues there. So it really took off um, in the last year and a half. So putting together your digital art and your, um, your Earthseed love, one of our Shaping Change members found me on Instagram and was like, have you seen her Octavia's? So you have these Octavia images you've made that, you know, we poked around a little bit uh, and seen, and they're absolutely stunning. Of course, we're biased because we're, you know, kind of Octavia fans here. Uh, but I'd love to know more about them and kind of how you created them, what the impetus was, et cetera. Yeah, so um, probably in 2017, I was teaching AP computer science principles, and I wanted to introduce students to ways to do computer science using art. And so I was looking for all kinds of creative ways to do that, and I found um, something called Deep Dream that came out of Google, but then they released the code in 2015, and then people started making these platforms where you could go make art using Deep Dream. And it's kind of like a uh, relation sort of related to facial rec um, facial recognition through AI. It's in that same umbrella, but I thought it was interesting instead of being very negative about you know looking at it from the oppressive side of AI, this is a way of being creative with it. So we had to explore both of those things with the students so they are aware of the negative connotations and also the realities of artificial intelligence in communities and black and brown communities specifically. And most of the students that I had um, that year were black and brown students and girls. Um, in that class. So it was important for them to be aware of that, but also find creative ways to, to um, learn it and figure out how to be creative with it. So, um, but I liked it too. So I started taking photographs of students and just started really playing around. And then after a while, I realized I really, really liked it. So um, in 2019, I made a um, sort of a challenge to myself to make uh, AI image a day for 365 days. Um, so, and I didn't know, um, I said, I think something might happen. I'm not sure, but I feel like I'm going to have a relationship with this machine for 365 days. So for 365 days, I've made a portrait, um, every day. And I would sometimes, most of the time I put it on social media and then started getting the following. And then I started printing them out and sharing them and put, putting them in places and people started, can we buy it? And they wanted to buy some of the work. And I said, oh, you have a website and didn't have a website. Um, and then so I set up a website in the end of 2019. And I remember when I set the website up, I put a e like a store and then um, I, then I shared it on Twitter. And then somebody's like, well, I'm trying to buy something. It's like, you know, minutes later, I, I'm trying to buy something. I can't use the store. And I'm like, oh, someone's trying to buy something now. <laughs> oh, while you're setting it up. <laughs> let me just go in there and do all that. So then that happened. And I didn't have, I work full time. I have other things I'm doing. So I didn't really have a lot of time to keep that up. So I did a little bit in that. And then when the pandemic hit, I took the store down. Um, Cause I'm not gonna run around and do all the stuff I did um, when, um, before the pandemic, before the store. And then um, exhibitions started happening. So people started asking me to, to commission me to do work. And that included um, Octavia. Mm. So I was already doing portraits. I had done a few portraits, but I'll tell you from, from the beginning. Um, but also as, so something has started to happen where sort of my hand started to take back over the process and the machine kind of took a background. Um, mm. And that's what happens when the 365 days. I started to learn how the machine worked. The machine learned from me and our collaboration got better. You know, I oh, that is a great story, and and mm -hmm. I and because we're talking about a visual uh, well, medium, yeah, right I'm now, thinking, like, Where do I go? <laughs> Monica, could you put up the opening panel with Natrice's self portrait so people can understand what style of art well, she's I talking about? It. Yeah, there she is. Oh, perfect. See, so this is how her digital art looks, and it is so compelling to the eye. And so gorgeous and so different. Oh, well, we can put it down now. Uh, and I've also put up the link to your website so people can, after the webinar, or uh, or if you insist, or in, you can you can flip through and look at some of the art. But can you explain just very basically how does this work? I don't get it. I mean, I just I don't know. So what what how how? Oh, so, 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 so,
<laughs> so I, 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 just so you know, I'm gonna, I did an Octavia for uh, the Smithsonian. I was commissioned to do Octavia. They have an exhibition in November titled Futures. Wow. And it is, uh, yeah, and so oh, it's, it's an arts and industries building and it's gonna be about possible futures on the horizon. And they have a the first major commissioning pro project for that building in like over 25 years. So um, the the way they, the press release will probably be something like five boundary pushing contemporary artists is I'm like reading their part of their PR um, press release. And so it's a site specific, these, um, these portraits are gonna be totems, like 68 inches tall, mm -hmm. 68 inches tall, so about five to six feet tall um, throughout the exhibition. And one of them is Octavia. Um, so there's a list of futurists they gave me and Buckminster Fuller, Octavia Butler, Floyd McKissick, his Soul City Project, um, just a variety of different people, very diverse um, group of people. And then at the end of that list, he said, by the way, we want you to do a self portrait for the exhibition. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing is the, the small version of the 68 foot, I'm sorry, 68 inch um, uh, version that will be in the Smithsonian along with Octavia and the other people. Um, so, other futurist. So, um, sorry. you're one of the futurists. Yeah. So, um, so the way, so, you know, the technical vernacular creativity stuff is kind of related, but the idea is to make the work as sort of combine an image of each subject with an AI neural network. And then, uh, it kind of synthesizes the images and patterns to create these new kind of aesthetic um, and it goes beyond this it goes beyond the scope of human thought. So this is not really something that's easy to make um, physically like analog. You have to sort of do this is an aesthetic that comes out of the process of doing this um, neural network art stuff. And so the resulting images kind of opens new frontiers for artistic expression, but it also poses moral and ethical questions about future uses of AI as well as intellectual property. I um, gave a I did a was part of a panel this week with lawyers on copyright <laughs> and I loved it because they really had no ish way to really tell me whether or not, you know, they, it's such a gray area. So according to the law in the United States, if a machine is uh, it's an automated process that you're using, you can't copyright or do IP for that. Um, it is oh. different in the UK, um, but because of the way that I'm doing it, where my hand is, it's we're collaborating. We're not, it's not just the machine doing stuff. We're collaborating. Um, that takes it into a different realm. So you so, are basically stretching the boundaries of known uh, legal parameters. <laughs> right. So the lawyers are like, so then I put in like, you know, while they were asking questions feverishly in the uh, chat, I'm like, well, you know, it starts off with a photograph of uh, like of Octavia. Um, I'll think about, you know, kinds of uh, things that Octavia is about her writing, different ideas and concepts that come out of Octavia's work. And then I'll find images, sometimes stock photos, but, you know, maybe nature. I was looking at um, kind of thinking about earth, uh, earth seed and thinking about like growth and plants. And so some of that had a role in the production of the uh, of the uh, um, portrait. And then um, I run it and then I often run it more multiple times. And then I sort of composite all of the uh, output that I like. And that becomes the portrait. So there's a lot of stuff going on, layering going on, but it's also the machine sort of recreating that portrait using the styles that I give it. How would you describe what you teach the machine and what the machine gives you? Um, so the, what I teach the machine is I want you to recreate Octavia as a nature, as a this natural image, as the universe, if the if that's the, you know the image of light. Um, sometimes I'm selecting images for light color, um, and that becomes uh, an output. And I, I need you to look at these particular features of Octavia's face. I need to, it has to be a particular portrait. So um, it can't be any portrait. It has to be something very specific. And um, that's just trial and error iteration. Um, and then in the end, I choose the outputs and then I composite it. Or sometimes it's just a run. I did a Josephine Baker last night because I saw an image of her young that I knew would work. 
And so it looks very much painted. Most people, when you print it out, they think it's been painted. Um, and I said, I know exactly what style will go with that portrait. That's because I've done it so much. Um, it is a process, but it's a process of understanding that the automation part is part, it's like a tool. Um, and I explain that to my students. Um, I used to teach batik art to students. Batik art came from Indonesia. And when you're doing batik, you have fabric, you have some kind of cloth, you have some kind of resist, sometimes it's mud, um, oftentimes it's wax. Um, then you have fabric dye and you go through an entire process of, in my case, I usually use con computer images that I then transfer using carbon paper to fabric. And then you take wax and you wipe all the parts that are light or white or the color of the fabric have to be waxed out first. Then you put down the lightest color, wax that out. And you just do that until all of it's been covered and you get your darkest color. And then sometimes you'll, you can ball it up so you get this kind of cracked um, effect in the batik. And then you melt it all out. Um, and then my, some people boil it out. I use an iron and many, many pieces of old newspaper to get the wax out. That is a process. It's not an automated process, but it is a, it's like an algorithm. It's step-by-step -step instructions to get to the outcome. And basically that is what Deep Dream is about. Mm. I'm going through a process of, of style and that style takes on and I look at it and I said, well, I need something else. Um, and a perfect example, the curator saw, um, I did the two scientists that helped on the Moderna vaccine. Um, and I forget the, the black woman, but I, the image they gave us was the two of them kind of standing together, him with his lab coat on. And she's got a T-shirt on that says, Black women save the world. And I don't know why I need to, both, we both knew we had to use it, even though it was low resolution. You got to use it. Yeah. So um, I went through this whole process of just trying to figure out. I actually used COVID um, virus as the style. Mm. Um, and that, and also from the vaccine. So for every futurist, including Octavia, like Helen Keller, I, cause I use Braille. Mm. So you see Braille in the texture of her face or around her face and lace and antique lace and things like that. And so you're directing the machine, the mm -hmm. machine and the machine interprets your directions and it mm -hmm. gives it back to you. Mm -hmm. Do you have a name that you call the machine or is no. it just? It's, it's Deep Dream. It's technically not Deep Dream. It's this guy, Leon Gaddis, who kind of invented the algorithm that I'm using. But um, I do see it as I know that it's going to do a thing. I know what kinds of images it likes or can use better than others. Um, but I, like the boutique art that I talked about, it's a process. And for every artist, they have a process for writing, for painting, for drawing, for boutique art. Um, using um, wax resist. In this case, this is I'm using a machine that that does a thing, uses the algorithm that does a thing. Um, and then I use that to produce these portraits, these images that have this kind of very um, hyper saturated, um, kind of very colorful, almost electric um, vibe about them. Do you... I'm just so endlessly fascinated. I'm sorry, Monica. I'm just jumping all over here with questions. But I'm... It, with, can you think of a specific situation where the interpretation just completely shocked and blew you away? Like it was like, I mean, okay, I told you to do this, but I didn't know you were going to do that. <laughs> so like sometimes um, I did a, a Corey Wise mm -hmm. from, um, you know, when they see us mm -hmm. I, uh, after I saw it stay with, he stayed with me. I did a portrait and it was a first time pass. Once it generated, I was like, that's it. And so, and I just like, I don't have to do anything else to it. Oh. Um, that's exactly, it. and I didn't imagine that that would look that way, but it's perfect. Oh, see, um, oh I would have a name for that machine. I'd be calling it <laughs> Betty, like, hey, Betty, um, we're going to be working together today, but that's okay. You're more of a scientific mind, I guess. So you're keeping it professional. <laughs> <laughs> What jumps out to me, I guess the words I hear, I'd love to hear you, like, this is a philosopher of me, right? I hear, like you say, process, tool, collaboration, relationship. And these are things that to me are like, these are our big, like, lessons, right, in many ways of the last year or so. Is like, things are not going to happen instantly. There's a process, right? There's we have tools, um, things tend to go better when we collaborate. And we I think we've all become aware of the power of relationships sometimes because they've ended, there's been grief, we've missed them, we've 
you know, all the different ways in which relationships have mattered. And so in many ways, it sounds to me like you're giving us this, you know, not just artistic process, but also this model for um, some of the things that help us have hope, right? Or help us be creative. What's, what's great is um, for me, is finding a space for the type of work I've been thinking about making or making on the kind of behind the scenes. Now I can, it's taking full uh, center stage. So the Smithsonian show, this pre-R uh, pre will come out. Um, there's also going to be the book that comes out in August. Um, that, the cover is the, it has some of this work. Um, it's a portrait of a student um, that I did early on back in uh, 2017 is on the cover. So, um, you know, and, and it's funny, I didn't tell the editor of the book uh, anything about my art. I just wrote the book. And then the person who did the forward, all she did is talk about the art. <laughs> and so at some point the editor's like, this is a great forward, but where's the art? Like, I, can I see some images? And I'm like, well, okay, great, thanks. So I sent her some images and she's like, oh, we got to do the cover. This is great. And then so she insisted on um, me using my art and not a photograph of someone or whatever on the cover. And so we did. As and, it should be, great. But that's a, it's, that image is a, you know, African fabric. It's a, you know, she's got a head wrap. It's a former student of mine. And so many of my images aren't just kind of random. They're abstracted sometimes, but they're usually black people. They're usually black women, not always, but, um, and children and of different ages. Um, sometimes they're celebrities and sometimes they're stock photos where it's easy to just, just use stock, um, Adobe stock photos or whatever. And so it depends on what I'm inspired by. But I like the fact that I'm using fabric. I went through this whole thing of using antique lace. Mm -hmm. And so some of my stronger images have in the recently people like have been the lace ones. Um, but there's a story behind it because I was thinking about the transatlantic slave trade. And what I was thinking about is the way that lace got made back then was that somebody picked the cotton, then the raw cotton was sent, you know, to um to England or to the, to Europe, Europe then produced cloth. The cloth went to, you know, somewhere else, and then and and result of, and tr to trade for the cloth. And slaves were, and people were enslaved and brought to the Americas in this kind of process. And I thought about that. I thought about you know these antique, beautiful antique lace and the labor that produced it, like the enslaved labor that produced the cotton. That, I mean, they picked the cotton that produced it to create the cloth. So then I started just using. Um, um, uh, stock photos of black women, mostly to in, in kind of uh, very beautiful poses or very kind of beautiful women. And just um, and it, it became it almost looks like it's been it's lace, like it's been created in lace. And so that w I did that for a while. Um, and that was the first NFT I sold that so is to that space. Beautiful. I want to back up one second to mm -hmm. the origin of some of the images, because back when we were talking about IP, uh, Sean, mm -hmm. who's on the webinar, got very interested about whether you're allowed to use any. Was this part of the conversation with lawyers? Or are you just allowed yeah. to use any image? No, I don't. And it's funny because I got into something very. So somebody in France that I know wanted to had a jazz festival and they wanted to use an image I had generated. This is a few years ago. And um, I said, well, no, because the original photo is a high fashion photo of an African model. Mm. Yeah. So he went and found the photographer. And when the photographer saw what I had made, he said, well, just credit both of us. Creating IP law as you go. <laughs> He's like, oh, well, it's not my photograph anymore. She did something. She remixed it. She did something. I like it. It's credit both. So they banners, posters went up. And this is over in France. So, I, you know, they sent me. I saw some musicians playing on the stage and the banner was in the back, but that photographer. And so that's the third time that's happened where somebody who was either the photographer or had, uh, you know, they have the state of, uh, of that particular image and said, you know, I like that. It's credit, you know? Um, and I, the most recently, I don't know if you know about Tina Bell. This is a great story. Um, Tina Bell is a black what was because she died in 2012. She is credited as inventing grunge music. Think Nirvana. Oh. She okay. Who knew? She, and she led a band called Bam Bam in Seattle in uh, the 90s. And because record companies did not want her, they wanted the three white guys she played with, including her husband. So they said, get rid of the black woman and we'll take the band and give you a record deal. 
Now, if you see her perform, she's electric. She looks like a model. She's great. But she had so much discrimination and racism that she faced that she eventually pulled away, became a hermit, moved to Las Vegas and died of cirrhosis and alcoholism. Her son, so the guitarist in the band and her had were married and they had a son. He just got an Oscar two or three years ago for a documentary. I forget the name of it. And he just co-produced the Tina Turner doc for uh, HBO Max. So her son is a Hollywood director slash producer. And he was raised by the dad. And then he didn't know that mom, his mother had passed away for two weeks. Mm. And by the time he got there, they had thrown all her stuff away. Mm. He said, even in death, they threw away her stuff. Like they disrespected the entire time. Unbelievable. Um, so well, I mean, unbelievable, but terrible. And you won't find her name. Like I looked, even on Wikipedia, she's a little sentence way down in the entry. So this, she's credited as inventing grunge. Why isn't she more pre present in the you know in conversation and books and text? She's basically unknown. So I was really touched. I did a portrait, and then um, I kind of shared it out, and I shared it out to. Um, it turned out the the bassist in the band, Scott Ledgerwood. So Scott sent me a message, and it looked like a warning. It because he was like. You know, somebody's been making T-shirts and they've been making sneakers or whatever with Tina's face and blah, blah, blah. And, me, you know, and then I was like, I'm sorry. I take you. No, 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 not you. No, 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 no. I can tell you made this portrait from the heart. Um, Tina would have loved those colors. He was like, oh, she would have loved this portrait. I'm going to use it as my screensaver. We're going to put it on the website. So it was a whole, but I just tell him because this happened yesterday to let you know <laughs> that people who just want to use her image without for, just to make money because mm -hmm. people are discovering her. But here's another black woman and a predominantly, you know, and I just thought it's just the pain she must have felt to know that she could not be a part of something that she had a lot of passion that she was known as something, inventing something um, really touched me. So in this case, portraiture was a way to get attention to Tina. But it also got the attention of people she knew that were, it was, I think uh, Scott was her last manager before she disappeared. So, um, and so be able to go back and forth to him, you know, uh, and privately and just have this conversation. So he's just listing all these black women and brown women in rock and roll music from Sister Rosetta Tharp to Polystyrene who have kind of been on the margins and, and then me on the margins of digital art. And also, you know, many writers on the margins as well. And it's thought, you know, art, visual art becomes a way to sort of bring it to the forefront. And sometimes it's a way to amplify um, voice in, in many ways, as you all know. And so this was one way I could do that for Tina. But it was there, it was definitely something that was interesting. My first, I wasn't panicking. I was more like, oh, I had to take it down. Um, he said, no, 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 don't take it down. I wouldn't put it on the website. And I want to, it's my screensaver on my, you know, you know on my uh, computer. So he said, oh, no, no, I'm just telling you about what's happening. So it is something I'm aware of, I'm careful about, but it's also something that when someone wants me to take it down, I'll take it down. I'm not trying to make any money, really. I'm just trying to generate art and put it out there. I, I hear these, like to me, it sounds like these Afrofuturist acts of love and activism. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, when you were telling about the lace, I was like, oh, I love this, right? Because this to me is the heart of Afrofuturism in many ways, where you're connecting to, to ancestry, to, to our past, as those of us of African descent. You know, you're reaching into the past and pulling it into the present and doing something very new and futuristic, right? And charting it. a path for the future, and that's beautiful, you know. And if I could just dovetail on that, um, the last time I spoke to you, Natrice, it was right after Hidden Figures had come out. Yeah. And really the bulk of our conversation was about you were starting to teach, you were teaching the first computer science class, that AP class to artists, and that was a whole new thing. Just this whole idea of how you personally have been able to inspire, especially young women and marginalized young women because of a lot of your teaching experiences. Someone in chat was asking, do you teach this? Um, how have you seen your impact as a teacher, both specifically within an institution, but also as a teacher, as an artist, where anybody who sees your website is learning from you on the spot. Um, I occasionally I get email from from people. I got an email from a Nigerian American. Uh, I think she was studying biomechanical or bio um, something engineering at Cornell, 
And she said, well, I got out, I graduated, but there's nobody like me here. I don't want to be, I don't want to do this. Um, either I want to go back to school. So how do you do it? Was her um, email to me. So we had a conversation. Um, and then she sent me this box. The box came to the steam lab. And inside of the box, there were just gala. It was like a bunch of Nigerian head wrap that she had done. And then a proposal on how to look at the math in it and the in it. So she was beginning to develop a program around this cultural, her, her own cultural heritage based on our conversation. Afrofuturism. Um, mm-hmm. And so she was, you know, taken in her direction. And so it happens. Uh, there was even when I was at Autodesk, so I'm, there's big robotic machines and arms and machines cutting laser, cutting metal and wood and all this other stuff. And residents are in there making this thing. So they brought a high school from Lynn, Massachusetts. They had won some kind of contest to Autodesk in Boston. And it's like, mostly black and brown kids and um so i i was asked it was the day my book was due so i was asked to stay to so the kids would see me working there um and they can ask me questions so i was like i gotta get my book is due at five and i was like you know i'm trying to get out of here i could see a little black girl on her head she had glasses her glasses almost took up her whole face and she was leaning up she was i see her almost jumping in the background when they came around on the tour I didn't think much about it. And then I uh, was upstairs looking at their posters and giving them some feedback. And she came up to me and her teacher said, it's okay. She has asked you a question. And she said to me, "Um, I just want to know how you're able to be here. I see all this stuff. I'm interested, but there's nobody here like me. But here you are. And then I met you and you're here and you, but you're the only one like you here doing this stuff. How are you able to just be here? Mm -hmm. And the teacher, everyone was kind of taken aback that she said it. And I forget what I said. I said mostly I, it was probably like, well, I'm here to work on a project. I don't care if they, if, I don't care if I'm part of that group. I don't care if they invite me to lunch or not. I'm here to do a thing and go to work, you know, and come in and come out. But I've been doing that for years, you know, in these spaces. And uh, I've been having to do that. And I've also been very alone. You know, I'm like, where is everybody else doing this stuff? Where are the people doing this stuff where well, I'm talking, I'm getting all excited and geeking out about the algorithms and James Brown's funk music, which is a whole nother story. But um, I get all excited. I see, even when I talk about it, I see a white guys get all excited. Mm. And I said, oh, this white guy's in computer science. If he's excited, then I must be on to something. Mm. But where's everybody else? How do we bridge that gap? Um, by putting work out, like dem- like teaching and workshops, but also just by having books out. Like I had to fight to get that book out. Mm-hmm. Well, you I, had fight, you. I had to fight to get, huh? Tell us about the book. Oh yeah, oh, tell us yeah. about the book because we're oh. all about to buy it. No. <laughs> I, I, you know, I found that I found that the the space when we talk about STEAM education, just like a just like the Tina Bell situation, nobody's ever talking about. We talk about engineering, but why don't we talk about Grandmaster Flash? What he did was engineering. Ooh, I got a tweet. He was self-taught, but he also took classes in engineering as a teenager. So he was studying engineering and he was stu- he was out in the streets and he wanted to create and invent and use scientific method and electrical engineering to make stuff. And he did that DJs use all the time now. But why don't we talk about Grandmaster Flash as an engineer? He even uses the language of a scientist when he's talking about his contributions to hip hop. So he'll talk about the scientific method. He'll talk about this stuff as thought experiments, which physicists talk about. And there's video of him doing it on YouTube. But every single time I see this, I'm like, why don't we talk about engineering and Grandmaster Flash? Then where are the other folks who are just artists um, who are doing stuff that are really cool? Um, why don't we talk about the math in G's Bang Quilts? They're using improvisation, but they're also using geometry and fractals to make these quilts. And they're pulling it from algorithms that come from the continent of Africa. There's a whole book, Ron Eglash's African Fractals. He started to study it. He went to Africa and studied it. How come we don't talk about these things when we talk about math, science, engineering, technology? Why don't we do that enough? So the book is doing that. The book is saying, here are the algorithmic aspects of James Brown. Here are the algorithmic aspects of Afrofuturism. Here's how we can develop software. Here's how we have developed software for that to teach kids how to use code to create designs that you would see artists making. 
like portals that you would see in Afrofuturism. You blow me away every time. Uh, well, I was going to say you open your mouth, but more specifically, I, you blow me away every time we have a chance to talk to you. And it's in a completely different way <laughs> on, on a slightly different topic. So you complain multitudes, Natrice, uh, and you are such a pioneer. I just, you just look at the chat. Everyone's so excited to hear everything you have to say. That's really more of a comment than a question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just, I, for me, I just, every time it comes up, I'm like, where are the contributions? Even my students, I'm teaching new media right now, and they're graduate students, and our, to become our educators, or our educators getting gradu becoming graduate students, and they did a whole history of new media, and the only Black folks in the entire thing were the ones I gave them to mm. include like i gave each student a, an, uh, an artist and then they picked two more artists but there was some and the student brought it up where's equity where are the people with disabilities where are the people with we find that in speculative fiction we find that in the speculative because we are creating those worlds for those marginalized folks but where is it in our where how does it get to everyone you know we have, we have pushed back with critical race theory okay crt we know george floyd has something to do with that um, it's a reaction to uh, what's been happening. Can we just start with the fact that I think most people railing against critical race theory literally think it's when you say anything critical about race and that's about all they, I, I, all right, never mind. It, it, it's a whole thing in law school. It's, there's a whole society around it. If you want to study what critical race theory actually means, <laughs> as opposed to how it's being used. But under, but they don't want, basically, it's the distancing from our history in yes. a nutshell. That's I it. mean, they came at the 1619 Project. Yeah. I mean, you look at, I was even worried for a minute about my book. I'm like, well, I'm like, I'm, but I'm not just looking at African-Americans. I'm also looking at uh, indigenous groups and their contributions, Latino and Chicano um, and engineering. Um, I'm looking at many different groups that are normally not talked about. And I'm looking at artists who show us how to do it. Um, in their work, like how they're doing that in their work. And then how will we teach kids how to do it? So here's some anecdotes of kids who get it. I love that part. So I'll say one other thing about it. So I found all the algorithms and fractals in, in African-American quilt making and got all excited about it. So I, I created a, a lesson plan um, uh, maybe a month or two ago. I did it. It was a bunch of girls. It was Zoom. And I show them, um, you know, here, here, you know, make your algorithm, make your quill design. And they had paper and glue. And, uh, and so at the end, this little girl gets on screen. She goes, here's what I mean. She holds it up. And let me show you my algorithms. Like she, sh and then she goes, this is, a, you know, this is my, like she, <laughs> like she got it. And it was like a half an hour of me just talking about AI. And I'm like, I don't know. These girls are kind of little. Do they understand what I'm talking about? They got it. They do get it. They're in some ways, when they're it. younger, it's easier because they, they haven't set internal boundaries about what they're not supposed to be interested in and what they can't do and what they shouldn't do. It's just, I, can, I mean, what a blessing uh, for every student who's ever been in your classroom. I mean, I, I, it is, she gives us the possibilities, right? She predicts stuff based on what she sees society doing right now. Like you can predict that if we keep going in this direction you know, if we keep not having being involved in technology, they're going to use it against us and then we'll be powerless against it. If we know how to create it, if that's a bridge, that means we know how to make stuff with the technology, even if for our part, our own purposes. But now we are more familiar with it. Wow. You know, we talk about Octavia the predictor, you know, we've also talked about her so much as the, her ability to predict came from her deep observation. And so much of what you're saying is like, well, look at the quilt. Look, there are fractals there. There's this, mm -hmm. right? It's deep observation, yes. form, right? Mm -hmm. Deep mm -hmm. observation um, that is really, you know, fueling so much of what you're doing. And yes. so, you know, it means you're kind of prophetic too. I'm having a good time, you know, when I'm in the space. It was a little pressure to the Smithsonian show because it's the Smithsonian. But, you know, in general, um, I'm trying to, I'm learning new stuff. Um, when I'm teaching students and they're talking back at me, here's the code, or I have a student who says, well, I noticed that no one picked anybody black or brown or what this is, you know, anyone different. It was more like just white guys, really. Um, I realized they don't know. 
where to look. They don't have, so for me as a student, um, it was difficult because I didn't have anything to tie my research to. And if you're academic, and especially if you're a research student, they will tell you, you have to build on the shoulders of giants. But if the giants don't look like me and they don't come from my background, how can I build on them? If they're not studying the stuff I'm studying, how can I build my work with that? So I really could not get a hold for a while. I had to fight. So I said, well, then I guess I need to put a book out so somebody like me will say, well, you know, this research over here by, you know, Dr. Gaskins, this book and this theory or whatever. So I just found out that somebody in Virginia Tech did that. They took a story from the Afrofuturism 2.0 book that I wrote, the chapter, and they used that reading on Afrofuturism and techno vernacular creativity to create a course. And a mu it's called the Intellectual Mixtape. So two faculty members used it, and um, among other things, to inspire the students and get them to do an audio, like a, a experience, a creative experience. So it's starting to happen, even before the book is out. That is fantastic. And, and I think you've actually answered a question um, yeah. from Jolanda Davis in the chat about blending the scholarly with the artistic, because the answer is getting it out there in, in both ways, the art out there through your website and your various social media platforms and the scholarship out there through the book and your article and, you know, your chapter that that is so very important. You know, and I really am moved by, I know we're nearing our time, but I'm really moved by the discipline you talked about in the very beginning. Like, I'm just going to work with this machine every day for mm -hmm. a year, right? And how that transformed, not you were just using the machine by the end, right? The machine is like getting you, right? And understanding you. And how, I'd love you to say just a bit about how that kind of discipline or that kind of, the beginning of that kind of artistic process um, how important that is for you? Is everything like this discipline for you? Other, other times, is it very spontaneous? Or I'd love to hear more about that. Um, I think there's spontaneousness. You know, I'll see something that really inspires me, an image or a story. Um, I find an image for the story, and then I go with that. And this uh, AI machine learning stuff is in music. Um, I built a box that's supposed to do with music. I just, the pandemic hit, and I couldn't finish it. So I need to program the box. But you can do that with sound. Um, some sort of deep dream type of sound experience, which I, I wanted to go there, but locked down. Um, so there's, and then we're doing this with dance performances in Trinidad Carnival as a Mozilla project. And so we're working on that now. Um, so performance and dance, visuals, music, there's so many other areas where we can, um, where the, the program itself, the algorithm is coming out of our culture, not coming from somewhere else. And that we are using that as part of programming the technology. That's what I'm excited by. The aesthetic that emerges, right? That emerges from us. It emerges from our own experiences as creatives, as women, as Black people, as brown people. And it becomes part of that algorithm that we're using to create those, image, that, those images. That's why people respond to it the way they do. You're so right about the response in particular. I mean, you just, it's great. It's like you're from the future. <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know, honestly, I could always speak to you for another hour on, uh, but we are coming close to the, the end of our time. Um, I want to tell you so much. where you can get your book too. Yeah, well, here's, uh, yeah, here's how you can order the book. Let me write that down myself. Techno Vernacular Creative, Creativity and innovation. I just love it. I love every word of the title. <laughs> I'm a little bit to make it easy to get to. <laughs> so I wish you all the best with it. Um, and there's a link up in, in chat. Uh, it's MIT Press. No small thing there, by the way. So just congratulations, period, on on reaching this next level of of um, showcasing your your work and your thoughts with the world. Well, thanks for having me. We're thrilled. We're just, this has been amazing. The The chat has been on fire. So we, we just want to mention to everybody who's who's watching this that if you like these kinds of conversations, um, once a month isn't quite enough. You'd like to make it a little more personal where your faces are on screen and you're getting to know each other and talk to each other a bit more. We do have a, an ongoing workshop we call Saving Ourselves, Shaping Change 
workshop, which generally meets the week after this one. I think this week is two weeks after, but you learned seven steps of Octavia's method of shaping change as we have come to interpret them, uh, Monica and myself. Ongoing discussion of Octavia Butler's work and influence. The Shaping Change e-journal with monthly writing prompts. That's a fun part. And that e-journal is, is very useful, useful for centering yourself. Interaction with us that's more personal, not just in the chat. A social media group where we can build community and talk about things when we're not doing the webinar. And as a sign up bonus, I have a recording of an interview that my husband Stephen Barnes and I did with Octavia Butler in the year 2000, when we were just starting to see the beginning of sort of this renaissance in Afrofuturism that is really coming to full bloom now. But even back then, we could see the writing on the wall, and that uh, is a treasured conversation that that you get just for signing up. So if you think you'd like to join our workshop, Saving Ourselves, Shaping Change, Learn More, or Register at www.octaviawebinar. Dot com. So we thank you all for being here with us. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and your enthusiasm in the chat, which is always like half the fun for me is the chat section. Uh, okay. If you enjoyed what you saw, go out and tell the world under the Octavia Tried hashtag. And you'll also find this replay up on YouTube, usually within 24 to 48 hours. So it's not going to be up like immediately, but it will be up very soon. If you'd like to share it, feel free. Share it with friends, share it with, with anybody, share it with your social media. Dr. Natrice Gaskins. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We are so excited about, I think everyone's going to start stalking your website and your social media for all of these images. Um, they'll be hounding you about how to buy them, no doubt. And we just thank you so much for the work, just the beauty you're putting out into the world, but the way in which you're doing it that is just going to change all of us. Yeah, thank you. amazing, amazing. Octavia would be so proud and thrilled. Okay. Everyone have a fantastic weekend. Thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time.